Good afternoon. Uh, this is Andrew Bluestein, Vice Chairman of Garfunkel Wild. Uh, thank you for all who are joined and joining. Um, today's topic is meeting ASC's obligations to disabled patients. And we are um, very fortunate to have my partner, Roy Breitenbach, uh, make uh, this presentation. Um, Obviously, we have a strong focus on, on ASCs, um, and that is a uh, shameless way for me to just give you a commercial for a second. Um, there's the fifth annual New York Metro ASC Symposium that's happening on November 2nd. Uh, registration and sponsorships are filling up, but uh, today's webinar is the first uh, of a series leading up to the November 2nd webinar, but um, obviously if you go on to the website, you will see the agenda. There are a lot of um, exciting programs, and if you're a nurse or an administrator, the credits are pending. We believe we're going to get them, and then uh, you can come and learn a lot more. If you register today, um, there will be a, a discounted rate um, of 285. If you want to take advantage of that, you should call the number that's listed on the slide. If you um, wait till tomorrow, then you can uh, register and sponsor using the website uh, NewYorkMetroASC.com. So we hope to see um, as many of you as possible at the uh, seminar. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce Roy to um, uh, lead us through today's topic. Uh, Roy joined Garfunkel Wild in 1994, and he is co-chair of the firm's litigation and arbitration group and a member of the Appellate Litigation, Employment Law, Environmental Practice, Personal Services, and Estates Planning Groups. Basically, he runs the place. Um, and he has tremendous experience uh, in dealing, and he's going to explain that to you as he goes through, of all the challenges that are happening to healthcare providers. And if you think this is not going to happen to your ASC, you are mistaken or naive because it's happening all over the place. Uh, Roy received his BA from St. John's in 1988, uh, where he was also, uh, then he went on to law school and he was an editor of St. John's Law Review. He's an extremely accomplished uh, litigator, a great partner, and a tremendous advocate should any of you get into problems that are popping up all over the place. So with that, We'll skip the commercial about Golf on Wild, which is on your screen, and turn it over to Roy. Hey, thank you, Andrew. Um, today's topic is uh, meeting ASC's obligations to disabled patients. It has been um, now uh, 27 years since uh, Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, and uh, healthcare providers and other businesses are still having issues and problems properly accommodating uh, patients who are disabled to ensure that they get full access to health care services that are offered by the various facilities. Uh, this is largely because the, law, the interpretation of the laws is ever-changing and there are aggressive enforcement efforts going on all the time. So everything combines to a perfect storm where uh, ambulatory surgery centers and other health care providers and facilities uh, find it very difficult in order to uh, comply with all the laws. So we're going to be talking about a few issues here today, and we're going to focus basically on six main points. Uh, the overall obligations of healthcare providers with a particular emphasis on ambulatory surgery centers and how to uh, ensure full and equal access to patients who are disabled. Uh, what, pol what changes in policies and procedures ambulatory surgery centers need to make sure that they have to uh, fully accommodate uh, patients who are disabled, 
how you provide, how ambulatory surgery centers provide uh, auxiliary aids and services uh, in order to ensure that patients who are deaf and other similar disabilities can fully enjoy the services, kind of an overall view of policy, procedure, and training to make sure that there's compliance uh, going forward, and then two particular topics which are very hot right now, which is making the physical premises, your physical ASC space, accessible to persons who are disabled, and also making your websites accessible to persons who are disabled. The last two issues are the subject of much litigation throughout the New York area. There's a lot of plaintiffs' law firms who are specializing in disability access litigation, who are bringing lawsuits against scores of healthcare providers each week, contending that either the premises or the websites of the providers are not properly accessible to persons who are disabled. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, kind of the entry point that I'm going to provide in all of this is to talk about two fact patterns. The first fact pattern is a traditional disabled patient fact pattern, and the second fact pattern is a website fact pattern. So let's go and talk about the disabled patient fact pattern. So if you are an ambulatory surgery center and a uh, patient who is, let's say, scheduled for an, op an ophthalmological procedure, um, and uh, you don't know, you've never seen the patient before, your front desk or your registration or booking person receives a telephone call from somebody who says that they are the patient's spouse. And this person says that the patient is deaf and will need a sign language interpreter when the patient comes for the procedure, cataract procedure, and that sign language interpreter has to stay with them for uh, at least the introductory portions of the procedure, the examination, the administration of anesthesia, the provision of informed consent, and to remain so that they can facilitate communication after the patient emerges from anesthesia while the patient's in the recovery uh, uh, unit. Um, the uh, front desk person who receives this telephone call is a new front desk person and doesn't really have a full grasp of the policies or procedures of the ASC and makes a reflexive response. And the reflexive response is, oh, if your wife or husband needs a sign language interpreter, we don't really provide them, so you're going to have to have, your spouse is going to have to have the surgery at a hospital. That is a fact pattern that is taken from a real case. And in that situation, the ambulatory surgery center was hit with over $100,000 in compensatory damages and fines. The reason being that uh, it is the obligation of ambulatory surgery centers, all healthcare providers, to ensure that any patient who is disabled has whatever auxiliary aids and services that they need that are reasonable in order so that they can fully enjoy the services. And so by the person at the front desk who is poorly trained saying, um, that the ASC does not provide interpreters, the patient should go to the hospital, that is a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act and state and local anti-disability discrimination laws. What's particularly interesting about this fact pattern is even if the ASC did in fact have an interpreter that was ready to come in or used or had a video remote interpreting a machine on premises to provide interpreting services, the very act of the front desk person who was untrained saying that they can't accommodate, that the ASC can't accommodate the patient is enough to create a liability. And the liability is not just monetary damages. You're also paying for the plaintiff's law firm's attorney's fees, and you're getting a lot of negative publicity as you have to provide training, enter into a consent decree, and all of the things associated with that. So this fact pattern emphasizes that it's not only making sure that you strictly comply with the law and provide sign language interpreting services and the other services you need to, uh, need to provide to ensure that disabled patients can fully enjoy the medical services that are provided, but also the need to have your staff fully trained. One misstatement by a staff member 
could create significant liability in this area for the entire ASC. Uh, second fact pattern is kind of the hot fact pattern now uh, with regard to websites. You're an ambulatory surgery center, and like everybody else in the world, you decide to have a website. That website is to market your services. It announces all the great things on you about, about your ASC, why patients and referring physicians should choose your ASC, and it also has an ability to book appointments directly on the website. In addition, it has information materials on the website so that patients who are coming in for some of the top procedures can read the, uh, read the information sheet or watch a video so they can be more fully informed before they come into the ASC about the nature of the procedure. This is something that most ambulatory surgery centers have on their website and it's kind of state of the art and good marketing. But what happens if one of the patients who are scheduled to come into your facility or are considering using your facility is blind, okay? Blind persons have the ability through some new technology called screen readers to uh, put some software on their computer that enables them to uh, go to a website and have the materials that or the data that is contained on that website converted to speech so that they can understand what's on the website. This technology is great, but websites must be optimized in certain ways so that the screen readers can properly interface with the website. The biggest thing is it has to have something, the website has to have something called alt text meaning that all of the images and places where you click on the website have text behind the icon or the image so that when the screen reader goes to that point on the website, there's actually text that can be converted to speech so that the, uh, so that the blind person understands what's going on. Also, the, the various forms on your website have to be configured in such a way so that they're easily manip manipulable by persons who are not only blind, but may have mobility disabilities that prevent them from fully using a mouse. And videos on your website should have the ability to be converted into closed captioning for persons who are deaf. If your website does not have these features, there are plaintiff's law firms that are right now bringing 10, 15 cases each week against healthcare providers and other businesses in this area contending that the websites are inaccessible to blind and other disabled persons and are seeking in class action lawsuits significant money damages plus attorney's fees and plus uh, spending considerable amounts of money to optimize the websites and to train the staff. So this is something that uh, before you get sued, you can go in, you can look at your website, you can work with your IT people, to make sure your website is properly optimized and thereby avoid the significant liability. Okay, so let's now go kind of to the heart of the presentation. Let's do a little bit about the Americans with Disabilities Act. As I described, uh, it's enacted in 1990 and it contains three different titles. First one is discrimination in employment, which we won't be talking about here. Second one is discrimination by governmental entities like state government, city, schools, things like that, which we'll touch on briefly. And the third, which is the one that is key for healthcare providers, is discrimination by public accommodations. Public accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act is any business or service that offers its goods or services to the public. So healthcare providers, ambulatory surgery centers, physician offices, hospitals, clinics, all fall within the definition of public accommodations. And in addition to the Americans with Disabilities Act, state and local governments have also enacted their own disability discrimination laws that in many cases mirror and sometimes take the protections of the ADA even further. The local laws that might apply to you are the New York State Human Rights Law, which applies throughout New York State, the New York City Human Rights Law, which applies to businesses in, in New York City and contains some pretty uh, increased or enhanced provisions over and above the ADA. 
the Connecticut Human Rights and Opportunities Act, which would govern providers in Connecticut, and the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination. Um, basically, um, there are um, four key principles you have to remember about the Americans with Disabilities obligations concerning uh, disabled patients. The first is the general overall one that it's illegal for anybody, any healthcare provider, any other business, to, to, to discriminate against people with disabilities, okay? But unlike some of the other anti-discrimination provisions, such as sex discrimination, race discrimination, national origin discrimination, Title III doesn't just prohibit discriminatory conduct treating disabled people differently, talking poorly about disabled persons. Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act also contains an affirmative obligation. And that affirmative obligation is, is, is known as the obligation to provide reasonable accommodations, okay? A healthcare practice has an obligation, an affirmative obligation to provide reasonable accommodations in order to eliminate barriers that prevent persons with disabilities from fully enjoying their services. So if there's a barrier or at your facility, it can be a physical barrier, it can be a policy or procedure that is preventing a person who is disabled from fully accessing the services that you offer, you have an affirmative obligation to search for and if you can, provide a reasonable accommodation to eliminate or enable the disabled person to overcome that barrier. And if you don't do that, if you fail to provide that reasonable accommodation, you are guilty of disability discrimination and subjected to all of the penalties associated with disability discrimination, okay? There are basically three types of reasonable accommodations that healthcare practices and other businesses have to provide. They are one, require changes to policies or procedures, two, provision of auxiliary aids and services, and three, removal of architectural barriers. So we'll talk about all three. Okay, required changes to policies or procedures are simple, right? If you have a policy or procedure and that presents a barrier for a person who is disabled, you have to enable them to overcome that policy or procedure. Classic example is companion or service animals, right? Most ambulatory surgery centers are gonna have a provision, we're gonna have a policy or procedure that's dictated by the regulatory authorities that say no animals allowed in the facility. Can't have somebody in the facility who's an animal, right? However, if you have that policy or procedure, that presents a barrier to a disabled person who uses a service animal, okay, and needs the service animal to help them overcome their disability. So, if that policy or procedure were to apply to them, they couldn't fully enjoy the services you're offering because they wouldn't have the ability to have the service animal assist them while they were on your premises. So the Americans with Disabilities Act and the state and local laws would require you to make an exception to your no animal policy in order to accommodate a disabled person who uses a service animal. And we'll talk about that later. Second kind of classic example of, sure most of the ASCs have a policy or procedure that requires a patient coming in to fill out a form that contains information to register and provide your medical condition. And that form has to be fully completed before you take the patient in the back or before you do anything with the procedure. But somebody who is blind can't use that form. So you're gonna to have to have some alternative policy or procedure so that the blind person can provide the information that's needed in order then to go back and access your services. So those are kind of some examples of required changes to policies or procedures. The second one is, the, is really the one that was the first that was most heavily litigated uh, for healthcare providers. And that's the obligation to provide auxiliary aids and services. In order to provide uh, equal access, healthcare providers, like all public accommodations, must provide auxiliary aids and services for people who are deaf or hard of hearing when needed. The whole concept is, is that 
if you want to, if, if you have a good in service, or you, you, let's say you're providing healthcare service, in order to afford a person who is deaf with the same access to that service as a hearing person, you need to have some mechanism to provide that person who is deaf with effective communication about their medical condition, treatment, and prognosis. And that the means by which you provide that effective communication is the provision of some auxiliary aid or service. That can be interpreters, it could be pen and paper, depending on the circumstance, it could be lip reading. There has to be some auxiliary aid or service that needs to be provided to ensure that the deaf person has effective communication about their medical condition, treatment, or prognosis. And as we'll talk about, this is not a continual obligation, but only for the key parts of the uh, patient's treatment. Although in the ambulatory surgery context, it's going to be, be because you, you, usually patients are not staying overnight, it's usually going to be for most of the time that the patient is in the ambulatory surgery facility, you're going to have to provide interpreting services or some other similar auxiliary aid and service. So we'll talk a little further about that. Um, as I said, auxiliary aids and services can include qualified interpreters, note takers, or written materials. For example, if a person is blind, you may have to provide special written materials in Braille, depending on the circumstance. The type of auxiliary aid or service depends upon what's needed for a specific situation. The law recognizes that there is not one size that fits all. It depends upon the person. However, going way back to when the Americans with Disabilities Act was first, uh, was first enacted, the federal government, the United States Department of Health and Human Services, has said that it is extremely difficult for a healthcare provider to demonstrate in certain service settings that effective communication is being provided in the absence of interpreters. So it's very important to remember that in most situations where you have a person who is deaf and you're in a healthcare situation, you're going to have to have certain, you're going to have to have policies and procedures in place, in place to provide um, that person with uh, interpreting services. And that's especially the case since the passing of the Affordable Care Act. With the passing of the Affordable Care Act, uh, Congress made it clear that you have that a public accommodation, a health care provider, has to give careful consideration to a patient's preferred means or preferred auxiliary aid or service when dealing with a patient who is deaf. So, for example, if a patient is saying or requesting an interpreter, it's incumbent upon the healthcare provider, the ambulatory surgery center, to provide an interpreter unless they have a really good reason why they, in a certain circumstance, there's another mechanism that would be equally as, as effective to uh, provide the effective communication. So the whole thing turns around on who is a qualified interpreter. A qualified interpreter is someone who is able to interpret effectively, accurately, and impartially, both in providing information and receiving information use, using any specialized vocabulary. An individual doesn't have to be certified. There's no magic certification. It's just that given the unique circumstances, the person is qualified to provide interpreting services. Um, I know that there's a trend in many places to allow a family member to be used as an interpreter. Family members under the law are not considered appropriate interpreters because they have emotional or personal involvement with the patient, which raises issues of their impartiality, and, there's, and they, may, they may find it difficult to maintain confidentiality. So unless the patient absolutely insists that the only person that they want as an interpreter is a family member, and the ASC explains fully that a family member may not be the best interpreter and that they can receive an independent interpreter, uh, facilities should almost always get a qualified independent interpreter. 
Now, the key interactions where effective communication is needed and ambulatory surgery centers should make sure that they have uh, a sign language interpreter or some other equally effective means of communicating with the patient. Are any discussions of the patient's medical conditions, symptoms, or history, reviewing or explaining uh, informed consents, explaining what medications you're, being, you're prescribing or are being sent home with the patient, and dealing with complex billing and insurance issues. Now, sign language is a confusing concept, and the one takeaway message is, is that there are multiple sign language systems in the United States. Not everybody speaks the same sign language, so it's very important that when you're getting a sign language interpreter to make sure that there's a period of time in which the sign language interpreter becomes comfortable with the deaf person and that they can both verify that there is effective communication that is going on. Because if because of some idiosyncrasy in the way the uh, deaf person communicates, that sign language interpreter can't communicate or doesn't use the same line sign language as the deaf person, you don't have a qualified interpreter and you have to find somebody else. Um, one solution that many healthcare providers have found uh, in providing interpreting services is the use of video remote interpreting. Video remote interpreting is a computer system. Nowadays, it's usually on the basis of an iPad or other tablet that uh, connects to some high-speed internet access and basically allows a, um, an interpreter at a remote location using the video technology of the computer device to provide interpreting services remotely to the patient. So through the camera and the screen, the patient signs, uh, and then that signing is picked up through the internet to the interpreter at the remote location, and then and then the interpreter voices back what what would have said to the uh, medical personnel in the room. Um, there are there are a lot of pros to video remote interpreting, but there also are a lot of problems with regard to video remote interpreting. One of the main issues with concerning video remote interpreting is that um, you need to have high-speed internet access with sufficient bandwidth to ensure high-quality uh, full-motion video and audio. So if you don't have a good internet connection, uh, video remote interpreting is not going to be effective and is not going to satisfy your obligation to provide effective communication. Um, you need to have a sufficiently large screen and your personnel needs to be trained to set it up. You also have to be prepared for what you're going to do if a patient objects to using it. Many deaf patients do not like to use uh, video remote interpreting, and uh, you have to be prepared to deal with their objections. Um, you can insist that a patient does use it if you believe their objection is not legitimate and that there's effective communication going on, but you have to proceed very cautiously in that area because if you do not, uh, the concern is that you're setting yourself up for a potential claim. Uh, there are some contraindications where you should never use video remote interpreting. Obviously, if the patient has limited ability to see the video screen, if the patient has a limited ability to move the head, hands, or arms, if the patient has visual limitations, cognitive issues, consciousness issues, or pain issues, they all may be contraindications for the use of VRI. Um, so let's now go to the next big section which is the removal of architectural barriers, okay? In addition to providing auxiliary aids and services, um, there's an obligation on the part of ASCs to remove architectural barriers that prevent patients with disabilities from fully accessing the provider's services. This is more than true architectural barriers, such as a door or things like that. It also includes such things as policies and procedures, lower encounter heights, providing accessible medical equipment, equipment to transfer a wheelchair-bound patient into, onto a treatment gurney, things like that. Um, basically, providers who are constructing a new facility or substantially renovating an older facility must comply with accessible design guidelines issued by the United States Department of Justice. 
basically if you've done anything to your facility after 2003, you have to comply with these uh, architectural guidelines which set forth precisely what you need in terms of a door, in terms of a width of hallways, where signage is placed, what you need for bathrooms, number of handicapped accessible bathrooms, etc. In addition to the architectural barriers, even if you have an older facility that predates the obligations to make changes in compliance with the Americans with Disability Act, you have an affirmative obligation to undertake readily achievable barrier removal. So that would be such things as making sure there's an accessible path of travel for a wheelchair user from the front door of your facility all the way through all of the public areas of your facility into the surgery room so that the patient can receive treatment, uh, making sure that you have counters that are at, a, at, a, at an acceptable height for somebody sitting in a wheelchair, making sure that there's at least one handicapped accessible bathroom, uh, and being willing to alter your policies and procedures regarding intake to, accomp to accommodate somebody who's in a wheelchair or otherwise mobility disabled. Um, let's talk a little bit now about service animals. Um, service animals uh, are a, topic, a very hot topic recently. There's a lot of things, a lot of people who are making all kinds of claims that they're pet dogs or service animals and all kinds of crazy animals can constitute a service animal. Um, it's important to know, though, that under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the only appropriate service animal is a dog that is individually trained to perform tasks or to do work for the benefit of a person with a disability. No other animals but dogs qualify. There is an exception typically for some miniature horses, although I've never seen that in, in the New York area. Uh, New York State and City follows the same general rule, and the tasks or works that the animal does must be directly related to the person's disability. Um, under the Americans with Disability and New York State definitions, emotional support animals are not included. Emotional support animals are animals that provide a sense of safety, companionship, or comfort to those with psychiatric or emotional disabilities. These animals may have some therapeutic benefits, but they're not trained to perform specific tasks for their handlers, and they're not uh, governed by the ADA or defined as service animals. And ambulatory surgery centers are not required to allow emotional support animals, only service dogs. And here's what an ASC's obligation is regarding service dogs. You must allow service dogs in all places of public accommodation to which the public is customarily invited or permitted. Okay, so for healthcare facilities, this essentially means the waiting room and a pre-op area in which you allow patients' family members to come in, and really pretty much any place in the facility except for the sterile operating room or other locations in which you wouldn't allow a family member to come in. Okay, the public accommodation is not required to allow a service animal to remain if it poses a direct threat to the health or safety of others. So if the service dog is growling and lunging at other patients and you ask the patient to have the service animal stop and it can't get the service dog under control, you're well within your rights to ask the dog to leave. Um, there's only real two questions that you can ask regarding a service dog. One, is the dog a service animal required because of a disability? And two, what work or task has the service animal been trained to perform. You can't ask about service animals, anything about the person's disability, require medical documentation, require a special identification card or training documentation for the dog, or require that the animal demonstrate its ability to perform the work or task they're supposed to perform. I want to talk a little bit about special identification cards because there's a lot of talk about that now. You know. There's internet sites in which people can go on and get an identification card identifying their pet animal as a service animal. And just because you, somebody may have, an animal may have a service a, a, a identification card or special harness or something like that, does not automatically mean that they're a service animal. They need to 
meet the definition of the ADA. So you have to go through what we just talked about. The fact that they may have or have not a special identification card is absolutely meaningless. Okay. Talk a little bit about enforcement for all of this, which is really important, okay? Um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, public accommodations are liable and you can get injunctions against them for failing to comply with the provisions of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And in connection with the injunctions, if, if you have to, if, if an injunction is issued against you as an ASC, the ASC is going to be obligated to pay the plaintiff's attorney's fees. There is no provision for money damages under the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title III. However, the Rehabilitation Act, which is a federal act that applies to recipients of federal funding and Medicare and Medicaid counts, allows the recovery of compensatory damages and attorney's fees to plaintiffs who are damaged by reason of a failure to reasonably accommodate. And New York State and New York City also allows compensatory damages. So we have here talking about kind of the three big areas regarding barrier removal, which is accessible path to travel, signage, and accessible medical equipment. Uh, the enforcers for, um, for um, Americans with Disabilities Act claims are private attorneys, and there's a whole host of private attorneys out there who are in this area, public interest law firms, the United States Department of Justice, the United States Attorney's Office, and state entities. Uh, there are some enforcement priorities that they're going through. Uh, the Department of Justice has a barrier-free healthcare initiative in which they're going through and, and receiving complaints from persons who are disabled about healthcare and pretty aggressively enforcing the law. If you, if you get on the Department of Justice's radar, they will want to sign a consent decree with you in which you pay compensatory damages to the patient, you pay a fine to the government, and you enter into a public consent decree, which they will put on your website and issue a press release concerning, so your, your facility will get some negative publicity. There's also a plaintiff's law firm, Eisenberg and Baum, that has a center for deaf and hard of hearing and are aggressively bringing cases against healthcare providers contending that they're not uh, ensuring that patients who are deaf receive qualified sign language interpreting services. And there's a public interest law firm called Disability Rights Advocates that's out there aggressively bringing mobility discrimination cases. Um, how do you minimize the risk for all this? Well, it comes down to policy, procedure, and training. You need to make sure that you have a policy that complies with the law you need to make sure that you have a procedures in your office to ensure that everybody understands and knows what to do when dealing with the request for reasonable accommodation, and everybody has to be appropriately trained. Um, the policy is important because if you have, a, if you have a, a, an important policy, it avoids the argument that you were deliberately indifferent to the needs of the disabled, which is what a plaintiff has to show under the Rehabilitation Act in order to uh, get money damages. It's also what the agencies first look at if they're, if they're investigating you. Do you have a good policy in place? Any policy needs to have a point person that, that, that is the person who answers all questions regarding disability issues. That person has to be knowledgeable. Policy also serves as a reference guide for the staff. You know, these disability issues don't come up often every day and at least the policy provides a reference guide for the staff when they do come up. Uh, a good policy should cover the facility's obligation to provide effective communication, the, how you identify a person needs or makes a request for auxiliary aids, the selection and use of qualified interpreters, the situations where VRI may be appropriate, and have an appropriate complaint me mechanism. The most important thing regarding procedures it's an early identification of need. At the first possible interaction between the patient and your facility, you should be identifying any need that the patient may have for a reasonable accommodation. Because if you can identify earlier, or at, in the earliest possible moment, you can get a sign language interpreter there, you can get the appropriate braille materials there, 
You can make reasonable accommodations in, in a less stressed environment. Um, another important procedure is documentation of requests for auxiliary aids and services and reasonable accommodations, very important. You also have to have the ability to manage your qualified interpreters. Know you have the ability to get qualified interpreters. And of course, follow all these up to make sure that the, that are repeat appointments or repeat procedures, that the accommodations are provided during those repeat appointments or procedures. Uh, very important in training. You have to use knowledgeable training, knowledgeable trainers, it's important to dispel certain myths, like all deaf people will read lips is a common myth, for example. Um, training has to be, training is most effective where one of the key people trained or anyone with access points in the facility. So any booker, scheduler, front desk person, very important to have them fully trained to avoid the fact pattern we talked about before. Um, have to, training has to understand the facility's procedure sensitivity to issues, and it's very important to make sure that these uh, training occurs not only for current employees, but for new hires as well, and the training is repeatedly refreshed and updated as situations change. Let me end with a little bit about website accessibility, which as I talked about before at the beginning, is a hot topic, okay. Um, as we've talked about throughout this, Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act concerns disability access for public accommodations. There's always been a question whether or not a public accommodations website is also a public accommodation. The law throughout the country has been un unsettled, but the Department of Justice says that under Title III, not only does the physical facility have to be uh, free from disability discrimination and accessible, but any websites that the facility uses also has to be accessible to disabled. And so for the last 15 years or so, private litigants at the Department of Justice have been filing legal actions based on allegedly inaccessible websites. And in the last six months, there's been a rash of these lawsuits filed against healthcare providers in the New York metropolitan area. Um, as, as I've just explained, the trend of law favors website accessibility obligations, um, and there are special rules for healthcare providers. Uh, basically, under the Affordable Care Act's Meaningful Access Rule, um, providers must provide accessible electronic information technology to patients who are disabled, and um, so that provides yet another reason why website accessibility is important for healthcare providers. Um, if you don't fully comply and make your website accessible, as we've discussed before, it leads to such things as government investigation. Uh, you could face compensatory damages, fines, and injunctive relief. Um, there are private lawsuits that I've just talked about that are all throughout and are becoming very rampant in the New York metropolitan area. These lawsuits are brought as class actions so the potential of facing significant monetary damages and attorney's fees, and of course, the negative publicity. The big question is, is how do you make your website ADA uh, compliant? And there's no one standard out there that in the law as to what you should do to comply. But the United States Department of Health and Human Services has strongly suggested that you use a standard called the web Content Accessibility Guideline 2.0 AA. You can find this on the internet. Uh, it applies to all federal websites must meet this requirement. The Department of Justice has used this guideline in its settlement agreements, and the Department of Health and Human Services has said that compliance with accessibility requirements will be difficult for covenant entities that do not adhere to the WCAG 2.0 standards. So the 2.0 AA standards uh, were enacted by a uh, not-for-profit known as the World Wide Web Consortium. It uh, basically is a single shared standard for web content accessibility that explains how you make websites accessible. The principles are, there's some key principles to accessibility. 
that, that the website provide text alternatives for any non-text content so that can be changed into other forms people need, such as large print, braille, speech symbols, or simpler language. Do you provide alternatives for time-based media so people with mobility disabilities can use things on the website? Portions of the websites don't time out. You create content that can be presented in different ways. For example, a simpler website, simpler layout without losing information or structure. And you make it easier for users to see and hear content, including a separated foreground from the background so people with low vision can more e easily read. Also, it's important not to have certain flash programs on your website because the flashes in certain videos can trigger seizures for people with seizure disorders. Um, other principles, make all functionality available from a keyboard. So if somebody who can't operate or manipulate a mouse can navigate the website. As we talked about, you have to provide users enough time to read and use content. Don't design content in a way that is known to cause seizures. Uh, make con content readable and understandable. Make websites appear and operate in predictable ways. Um, how do you how do you do all this? How do you make websites compliant? Well, you should first of all identify the publicly accessible parts of your website. You also should consider whether or not there's any issues with disabled employees accessing other parts of your website, so you can make them compliant as well. You need to do an internal assessment of what is and is not in compliance with the uh, WCAG 2.0 standards, and make appropriate changes guided by IP professionals. And what's very important is to do continuing audits and other compliance checks. That's important for the simple reason that websites evolve every day. New content is added, content is taken away. And just because the website was fully compliant and accessible to disabled today doesn't mean that somebody in the organization is not going to add a link or some other feature to the website tomorrow that is not in compliance. So it's very important to, to be regularly updated. And ask for feedback for people who are disabled about how easy it is to navigate your website. It's a very important thing to do to get some real-time, real view of the situation. So that's really the end of my presentation. I'll go with this some questions and answers. Uh, one question that um, I, I, I know I've, I've been asked here, and I've been asked at um, other times, is do you have to wait for a deaf person to request a sign language interpreter in order to provide it? And the answer to that is no. Um, when you look at the Americans with Disabilities Act and all of the other um, uh, state and federal laws governing disability discrimination, it makes it clear that a public accommodation's obligation to provide uh, auxiliary aids and services, including interpreting services, is not just limited to when a patient requests those services. It's also if the staff makes a determination that the patient even though they are not requesting those services, needs those services. So uh, we, we like to say it's a request or required standard. Um, so if a staff makes a determination that, the, that, that services are required, regardless of whether or not it's a request, you need to uh, provide interpreting services. So thank you. Um, Roy, let me ask you some practical questions. So somebody comes in, let's assume they're coming in for a uh, a GI scope, they're very nervous, and they have a bird that they bring with them, that brings them comfort. And they're demanding to take that back with them into the pre-op area. How, do you, how, how should somebody handle this? Well, you should say you have no obligation to put that bird, allow that bird in. That bird under the Americans with Disabilities Act and state definition does not constitute a service animal. So you don't have an obligation to, to allow that bird in. And in fact, in most circumstances, it probably would, if you did allow that bird in, it would probably violate some of the infection control guidelines or other guidelines from, let's say, under Article 28 or whatever your, your guidelines are for um, operating the ASC. So you should say to the person very politely, a bird is not, while it may be provide you with support, 
It does not meet the definition of a service animal, and we cannot allow it in the facility. Please call somebody to um, pick the bird up. Okay, um, let's say there's an ASC that has 10 doctors that are the owners, and the patient gets on the website of their surgeon's office, and, and they, they coordinate all of uh, the booking and everything for the ASC. So two-part question. One, if there's a doctor listening to this presentation, and there are, are their offices also, uh, um, are these standards and problems applicable to them? Absolutely. Doctor's offices are public accommodations, so they have to provide these uh, disability accommodations, including making sure their websites are accessible. And can an ambulatory surgery center get into trouble if they're one of their physicians doesn't have the ability? Yeah, so if you were talking purely, if you're talking about the area of, let's say, website accommodation, right? right. So, you know, if essentially the process is, is that the physician on their individual websites allows the ability to book procedures in the ASC, mm -hmm. then I would say if the, if, if the website of the physician was inaccessible, that could create liability not only for the physician, but also for the ASC, because the ASC is, is effectively using the physician's website as part of its own public accommodation. It's a, that, that mechanism is chosen to use for booking. Same thing, if, if, if they're using a live person to book, we call the doctor's office, and there's one person in the doctor's office who books for the ASC, and that person says, well, you know, you're deaf, I can't, we can't accommodate you with this ASC, I think that there's a good chance that not only would the doctor's office be held liable, but the ASC will be held liable as well. Okay, realizing that ASCs are often housed in buildings that they don't own, um, what should the ASCs be positioned vis-a-vis -vis their landlord if the landlord says, we don't allow dogs to come into the elevators? Okay, so, so, the obligation regarding accessibility in a landlord-tenant situation, the Americans with Disabilities Act and the state and local laws put the obligation on both the landlord and the tenant. So they're equally responsible for ensuring that the facility is accessible. And so if a patient sues, they oftentimes sue both the landlord and the, and the actual tenant together. Now the lease can allocate out responsibilities in the lease that's between the two of them to say that it's the responsibility for certain things for the landlord or the tenant, but for an outside person, both are equally liable. In the situation that you just presented, I think it's incumbent upon the facility to reach out to the landlord to point out to the landlord that their policy or procedure is violating the Americans with Disabilities Act and state law. They're subjecting themselves to significant liability and fine fines in addition to subjecting us as the tenant to the ASC to significant liability and fine, and we would look to hold them responsible to the extent that we were sued for it as well. Okay, great. Okay, so um, so this has been fascinating and scary. I'm sure the ASCs that join are, are concerned. Uh, we're here to help with policies, dealing with landlords, dealing with whoever. Uh, we're help, we can help get the technology in place on your websites and, and negotiate those contracts. Um, but again, uh, if you want to register for the seminar, do that today by calling the number. Tomorrow you could use the website, but it won't be at the discounted rate. And Roy, I want to thank you. This has been a fascinating presentation. Thank and you. we're also going to be posting this on the New York Metro ASC website. So if you want to tell people about it, they can get on there and there'll be a link to it. Thank so you thank you much. and have a good afternoon.